Well, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the annual open meeting of the British School at Athens. I begin by expressing the school's gratitude to the Secretary General of the Archaeological Eteria, Dr. Vasilis Petrakos, and to his staff, and to the many friends and colleagues who make our work possible. We particularly thank the staff of what is now the Ministry of Culture, Education and Religious Affairs, the former Secretary General, Dr. Lina Mendoni, the successive Directors General, Dr. Maria Andriadaki Vlazaki and Dr. Eleni Koka, and those in charge of the regions in which our major field seasons took place. For simplicity, I name them in the positions which they held at that time. Dr. Stella Krisolaki of the former Kappa Sigma Tau Febka, Mrs. Ekaterini de la Porta of the second Eva, Dr. Panayotis Hatsidakis of the Kappa Alpha Epka, Dr. Baraske V. Kalamara of the Yota Alpha Epka and the 23rd Eva, Mrs. Ioana Sepetsidaki of the Kappa Gamma Epka, Dr. Konstantinos Kisos of the Lanta Zita Epka, Dr. Vasiliki Misalido de Spotidu of the Yota Zita Epka, Dr. Alkestis Papadimitriou of the Delta and Epsilon Epka, Dr. Maria Fortini Papa Constantino of the Yota Delta Epka, Dr. Angeliki Simosi of the Ephoria of Maritime Antiquities, Mrs. Chrysa Sofia Nu of the Kappa Delta Epka, and Mr. Andreas Sotirio of the Lambda Epsilon Epka. The school's 2014 research program was a full one, combining the field projects, which you see here, with the work of the Fitch Laboratory and the Knossos Research Center, as well as our programs in other sectors, from the fine arts to history and the social sciences. In addition to our journals, we published Yorgos Rekemiotakis and Peter Warren's study of part of a terrace of middle Minoan townhouses beside the Palace at Knossos. And the first volume of a series on the latest Kairos excavations also appeared with the MacDonald Institute Press. We look forward next year to reporting the outcome of major changes in our publication arrangements. We will continue to publish field reports and a recast BSA supplement series, but we've established two further monograph series to cover the full range of our work. British School at Athens, Studies in Greek Antiquity with Cambridge University Press, and British School at Athens, Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies with Ashgate, both with a number of volumes now in process. I begin my account of this year's fieldwork on Crete, where new excavation in the Knossian suburb of Gripsathis forms part of Oxford University's European Research Council funded project, Agricultural Origins of Urban Civilization. Large scale bioarchaeological bio research will, we hope, provide the fine grained information needed to reconstruct the Knossian economy through time. This season's excavation, located close to Sinclair Hood's 1958-9 trenches at Hogarth's houses, revealed parts of two successive Bronze Age buildings, which date to transformative periods of Knossian history. The first, associated with Middle Minoan 3A pottery, may have been destroyed by an earthquake. At least one room was de deliberately backfilled with half-broken pottery. Outside it, a midden contained Middle Minoan 3A domestic pottery, and nearby superimposed dumps contained large quantities of late Minoan 1 pottery, predominantly conical cups. These are not normal domestic refuse, but rather specialized deposits representing repeated activities over time and demarcated by low walls. Overlying this area are the poorly preserved walls of two successive Hellenistic and Roman buildings. The second building produced architectural and stratigraphical evidence for Lake Minoan II and Lake Minoan 3A2 to be occupation. One area was modified into a staircase, which yielded unburnt Lake Minoan II pottery. In a nearby small room, three depressions in the bedrock floor along the west and north walls may have held storage vessels. This room too had been filled with bro broken Lake Minoan II pottery and artifacts. Evidence of fire destruction was found in three other rooms with Lake Minoan 3A2 to B pottery. Within an ashy layer, an inverted pedestaled lamp and a champagne cup was sealed by a layer of collapsed mud plaster from the walls. Elsewhere, a collapsed upper floor or redeposited destruction debris included column bases and stone slabs, plus pithos and storage jar sheds. Carbonized seeds of pulses probably represent stored supply. 
moving to East Crete on Palekastro. Excavation last year established that there is no palace in the so-called palace field, and that activity extended beyond a gully at the edge of the previously known settlement. This year, parts of three buildings were revealed in this new area, occupied in Lake Minoan I and Lake Minoan III. The eastern and northern perimeter of building AP1 was exposed, plus a number of floors and internal features, including a possible staircase, belonging to different phases, especially within Lake Minoan III. We cannot yet date the construction, but the size and technique of the walls, large ashlar blocks in local sandstone, suggest a neo-palatial date, while many stages of collapse, walls, floors, and other features are associated with Lake Minoan III pottery. The building was surrounded by a number of levelling fills and surfaces. A large dump of Lake Minoan III pottery to the north represents a one-time clearance of one of them, and an exterior fire pit or hearth was probably contemporary. A Lake Minoan III street ran immediately west of AP1, potentially lying between two houses, since a further wall bound it to the east. Building a AM1 is a well-built Lake Minoan I structure significantly larger than most freestanding houses at Palekastro, and comparable with a large building 117. From an entrance in the west facade, a vestibule led south to a staircase with fine painted plaster, and to one of the largest rooms in the house, room three, with a bench along its north wall, a pithos in situ, and an adjunct storeroom. The rest of AM1 is less well explored, although an in situ deposit was found, consisting of a large pithos with, in and around it, stone tools, a quern, loom weights, strainers, a firebox, an offering table, and pot stands. Soundings below these levels revealed into Alia a well-made, plastered and paved floor sloping down towards a drain. Material overlying it, accumulated during a phase of abandonment, indicates that the building was reused only late in the late Minoan period. Beyond the north wall of this room was a grinding facility, a large saddle quern and grindstone, and a jar built into the floor to catch the ground material. An associated possible foundation deposit consisted of a juglet pierced off to firing, likely using the bronze nail found with it. Excavation beneath this produced charcoal and sheds of a baking plate, while a heavy utilitarian bronze double axe under the partition wall may be a further foundation deposit. Lake Minoan III reoccupation is attested in most areas, including the external spaces around the neopalatial buildings, but is frequently ephemeral. Walls may have been poorly constructed, reusing older collapsed walls as foundations, but frequently we find simple reuse of a ruined structure without complete clearance or even levelling of the earlier collapse. A Lake Minoan I stone offering table found inverted on a low platform must have been preserved or scavenged. Only one corner of the third building, MP1, has so far been revealed, with a street running around it. The upper levels are neopalatial, probably Lake Minoan 1A, with no evidence for Lake Minoan 3 reoccupation. Finds inside the building are tentatively connected with craft production. A diachronic study of pottery production and supply at Bronze Age Palacastro was begun this year by John Gate of the Fitch Laboratory. It aims to characterise the range of fine and coarse wares used from Middle Minoan 2A to Lake Minoan 3A2, to explore possible local sources of raw materials, and to identify imports and their potential sources. It will examine transformations in manufacturing techniques and the transmission of technological knowledge over time, considering how potters may have moved within and used the landscape. A number of substantial deposits of red-coloured clays have been investigated between Castri and Bondolaki Bay, as well as extensive buff and grey-coloured neogene marl deposits near Scarion. Initial results from petrographic analysis of experimental clay briquettes and archaeological materials suggest that these coarser local red clays may have been used in preference to the fine neogene clays, although additional phyllite temper from an as yet unidentified source may have been intentionally added. Further petrographical and chemical analysis is now in progress. Among the other finds from this year's excavation, the mollusk remains are of particular interest. 
Two concentrations of crushed murex, hexaplex trunculus, probably used shells in perishable containers, were found among Lake Minoan III refuse in building AM1. This is one of the few large-scale domestic deposits of probable waste from purple dye production in the Aegean, allowing, of course, the possibility that this was also foodstuff. An experiment in the production of purple dye was conducted using fresh purple shells connected, collected from Palaikastro and Sitia, which were crushed to extract the mollusks using stone tools which were then kept for microware analysis. Linen, wool and silk were used in the experiment and two dye recipes devised. The liquid produced was saved for chemical analysis. The observations made, when combined with records of shell fragments and diagnostic features in the archaeological contexts, will offer insight into the method and scale of purple dye production on site. At Lefkandi, too, work has focused on the coastline and marine fauna. In collaboration with the Swiss School, cores were drilled at Lefkandi, Eretria and Aleveri to investigate the evolution of the central and southwest Euboean coastline. The presence of marine incursions and macrofauna in cores from the putative site of the eastern harbour of Xeropolis confirm its identification. Lefkandi has produced one of the largest collections of marine faunal remains in the Greek Early Iron Age, illustrating intensive and coherent exploitation of marine habitats over time. Exploitation of mixed substrates, gravel, sand and mud, expanded from the shore to the deeper waters of the Euboean Gulf, with collecting methods ranging from simple hand collection or the use of knives to diving or trawling. Murex shells, usually crushed, were found in almost every excavation context. Hexaplex trunculus was probably consumed, with shell waste thrown into the hearth either, either as fuel or for disposal. However, the hypothesis of purple dye extraction at a household or artisan level will be further investigated. The two other common shell types are oysters and fan shells, and the latter strengthens the possibility of fine textile manufacture, since it offers both an impressive nacreous shell and the fine filament commonly called sea silk. A wide range of other resources were occasionally exploited, including mollusks collected dead on the beach and used for their shell, thorny oysters as scoops and dove shells, cones and horn shells as ornaments. Fish were also consumed at Lefkandi, but on a more limited scale. These include nearshore species as the gilthead sea bream, the European sea bass and grey mullet, as well as sharks and rays, the last perhaps entailing memorable fishing trips, as suggested by an amulet made of a pierced ray vertebra. Among the projects advanced at Lefkandi this year, one programme of ceramic analysis was completed and another begun. The most extensive archaeometric investigation of Euboean and Euboean-related pottery to date, neutron activation analysis of samples from the main sites on Euboea, as well as of Euboean exports from Italy to Ionia, was published as the proceedings of a round table organised with the Austrian Institute of Archaeology at Athens. The new project is a Fitch Laboratory programme of petrographical and chemical analysis in collaboration with the Swiss School, centred on Eretria, but extending also to Lefkandi and Calchis, and involving analysis of previously sampled raw materials in order to correlate results from different chemical techniques. Eretria was, of course, a key player in Greek colonization and in the wide diffusion of Greek material culture and practices during the early first millennium BC. Diachronic investigation of its pottery production explores the city's role in the context of local, regional, and Mediterranean networks. The first phase, completed in 2014, focused on material from early Helladic II to late Middle Helladic, while the second, now in progress, spans geometric to Hellenistic. Analyses have identified the local fabrics in use throughout early Helladic IIb and early Helladic III for coarse, medium coarse and fine wares, covering a wide range of vessels for food preparation and serving, as well as storage and transport. Changes in local fabric recipes were observed during the Middle Helladic, alongside a number of new elements in manufacturing technology. Imported fabrics also changed through the Bronze Age, probably indicating transformations in the site's external relations and role in regional networks. Well, let's stay for the moment with the work of the Fitch and with three projects selected from what is now a worldwide network of collaborations in research, infrastructure and outreach. 
I begin with zooarchaeology and the work of Fitch bursary holder Angelos Godzinas from the University of Sheffield. He worked on an early Mycenaean assemblage recovered in 2008 during rescue excavation on the Theodoro plot in Thebes, directed by Vasilis Adorantinos. This well-preserved assemblage is the largest closely dated and contextualized body of faunal material from Mycenaean Thebes. It was recovered, along with marine shells and various types of drinking and serving vessel, from a deep late Helladic form pit just beneath the foundations of the palace. Preliminary results show a data set covering 12 domestic and wild species or taxa. Sheep and pigs are most common, followed by cattle, goat and red deer. Dogs, equid and hare occur in minimal quantities. Wild taxa include red deer, hare and possibly wild boar. The fairly high proportion of adult and elderly sheep and goats probably reflects emphasis on secondary production, wool and hair, in addition to meat consumption. The good preservation, combined with the presence of articulated bones, suggests immediate deposition in the pit in a single event. Macroscopic observation of butchery marks shows that they're consistent with the use of metal tools, and they reflect all stages of car carcass processing, with dismembering marks most common, followed by filleting and chopping, sometimes regularized, suggesting specialized butchery. Cut marks indicate that all identified species, including dogs and equids, were consumed, even if on a small scale. The relatively rare red deer may have been hunted for prestige rather than food, although there's ample evidence for the systematic exploitation of antlers. Working traces, including sawing and peeling or slicing marks, and specimens ranging from offcuts to preforms and unfinished objects, attest to the performance of all stages of antler craft production on site. A pilot study of antler working was undertaken in the laboratory on a subsample of the assemblage. Moving forward in time, a diachronic investigation of pottery production and supply at the sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Lycaon is a new collaboration with colleagues from the American School of Classical Studies and the Lambda Theta Epca. It focuses on a site strategically lo located on communication routes along the main southern Peloponnesian river valleys with long distance communications with Ithaca, from Ithaca to central Arcadia and southern Laconia reflected in its material culture. However, the dominant local component in the assemblage was the focus of our analysis. Significant quantities of Neolithic to Hellenistic pottery were recovered from a large ash altar. While it's unclear whether the site was a cult place as early as the final Neolithic, large numbers of Middle Helladic to early Iron Age drinking cups likely relate to ritual practices. Petrographic analysis identified nine fabrics among the coarser final Neolithic to Middle Helladic pottery, while chemical analysis enabled five main compositional groups to be defined among late Helladic to early Iron Age finewares. Raw materials are in most cases compatible with local geology. Fabric continuity is observed through the Neolithic, Early Helladic and Middle Helladic periods, although diversification is also apparent. But chemical analysis indicates a strong preference for more calcareous fabrics in the Early Iron Age. Preliminary reading of this evidence suggests a shift from highlands to lowlands. Neolithic fabrics reflect highland sources and the use of primary, non-calcareous and coarse clays whereas late Helladic and early Iron Age fabrics are associated exclusively with secondary calcareous clays from lowland areas, and at least some with neogene formations. Despite the formal and technological standardization of the late Helladic to early Iron Age pottery from the altar, compositional variability probably reflects the use and or dedication of pottery from a number of sources, possibly in the wider area. Finally, the Fitch has just begun a new project on the utilitarian ceramics, especially cooking wares, which have long been a key part of the laboratory's research. Previous studies have sought to identify the choices involved in manufacture and to examine how these affect the physical properties of both archaeological and traditional ceramic products and their affordances. They help us to appreciate the complex dynamics behind Potter's technological choices. And ultimately, they elucidate the cultural, political, and socioeconomic factors which favor the perpetuation and transmission of traditions or facilitate innovation for a material which was until recently integral to everyday life. The new project is a study of the renowned production of cooking pots on Sivnos, 
through the 20th century, including the work of the diaspora of Syphonic potters in the Aegean. And it integrates analytical data with archival material and interviews with traditional Syphonic potters. We'll report more fully on it next year. Returning to our field programme, study at Kenkriai focused on the so-called ploughed field in quarry complex A and the inscribed quarries in complex B, aiming to date and characterise activity in broad terms of settlement, supply or stone production, and to assess the scale on which provision was made for different forms of activity and from what sources of supply. The ploughed field yielded 40% of all the pottery collected in 2013, the vast majority being Roman. The densest concentrations at the west end of the field are effectively in situ. Fewer than 10 prehistoric sherds were found, early Helladic were datable. Thereafter, archaic to Hellenistic were more common, with three concentrations observed. Classical wares included fine table vessels in a mixture of Corinthian and imported, mostly Attic, fabrics, plus Corinthian A and A prime amphorae. Hellenistic pottery shows two chronological peaks which differ in character. The earlier, 4th century material is finer, or the later, 1st century BC peak, is characterised by Aegean, Northern Aegean, Cohen and Rhodian, and Italian, Greco-Italian, Lombolia II, and Campanian Dressel II to IV, Transport Amphorae, and by Eastern Sigillata A. A few Hellenistic cooking vessels or jugs were also identified. The early imperial period is also likely represented with Aegean and Italian amphorae, cooking pots, Italian and regional sigillata, and lamps. Thereafter, the volume of material increased through Middle Roman into the best represented period, the 5th to 7th centuries AD. Much has been made of a late Roman population explosion visible in survey data, yet finds from the ploughed field do not necessarily support this. A highly repetitive surface assemblage consisted of storage or transport vessels, late Roman two and three amphorae, drinking or serving bowls and plates, notably a restricted range of African red slip forms, large cooking pots and lumps of times common and presumably inexpensive throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. One or more of these was present in almost all collection units, or shapes such as deep basins, bins, jugs and loom weights are strikingly absent. Close analysis of the distribution and co-occurrence of functional types and the possibility of characterizing activity and identifying spatial variation through micro-GIS is the next step. Despite a marked decline in activity after the 7th century, several 9th to 10th century basins and 13th to 15th century cooking pots come from the east of the field. Further confirmation that evidence from the field represents non-quarrying production, settlement or support activity comes from the presence of almost all the glass found in the survey a non-local stone, roofing or flooring slate, marble flooring and limestone tessery, plus stone grinding and polishing tools, with the distribution close to the peak ceramic densities. In complex B, seven inscriptions occur in two groups in the north and south of the series of small pits that, co that comprise the inscribed quarry. This grouping may reflect the removal of other inscriptions during subsequent quarrying, or may denote separate and not necessarily coeval episodes of quarrying, as indeed the ceramic evidence suggests. The four fully legible inscriptions contain the names Nymphas, Megisthes, Symphorus, and Theotimus, suggesting a date in the first to second century AD. In all cases, the inscriptions were the final cuttings on the quarry faces, made with two distinct tools, one of which is clearly visible in contemporary quarry working. The rock surfaces were prepared to receive the inscribed letters, which were cut with short strokes from quarry picks. This explains the letter size and potentially some eccentricities of form, although despite the clumsiness of their tools, the inscribers were not well practiced in letter cutting. They were probably quarrymen. A concentration of pottery at the south end of the complex includes almost all the ancient tile retrieved, Greek and earlier Roman pieces and a variety of fabrics consistent with makeshift and perhaps small shelter roofs. The earliest shirt here, and in the complex as a whole, is an attic stemless cup of the first quarter of the fifth century BC. Thereafter, evidence spans all periods through late Roman, with a few much later pieces too, as the cook pot on this slide. This is the only part of the complex to produce a full range of open and closed vessels of all sizes, including provision for bulk storage. 
The pattern of deposition differs markedly in the northernmost areas, both inside and outside the quarried area, with a scant evidence for activity before later Hellenistic times. The majority of shirts, regardless of age, vessel size or firing, show little abrasion from transport. In effect, we observe a use pattern which is close to being in situ. Most sherds are early to middle Roman thin wall cups, consistent with the putative dates of the inscriptions. A small number of imprecisely datable Roman medium scale open and closed vessels within the quarry include some smaller late Roman three amphorae, forms consistent with personal or small group provision of water. Less datable pithoian bins were found both in the southern storage area and on the east side of the complex, mostly outside the quarry. Study of the chip stone focused on a sample of finds from Complex A outside the ploughed field. This assemblage is in fresh condition and apparently in situ. Over 85% is flint, mostly derived from small pebbles similar to examples found in the vicinity. Their small size governed the module of the flint assemblage. Pebbles were napped in situ near the quarried area, with debris, cores, flakes and tools present in the sample. The chronocultural definition of this lithic assemblage is, however, a major challenge given the late date of the accompanying pottery. Eight obsidian artifacts have suffered damage and some have blunt ridges and edges. The presence of this obsidian and the condition of the pieces might indicate a prehistoric, perhaps only Bronze Age, component. The final field project which I'll present this evening is Olynthos, where we began a five-year synegasia aiming to build a holistic picture of Greek households in their urban setting. Geophysics, excavation and field survey were used to investigate the spatial organization and preservation of a largely unexcavated zone in the northeast of the North Hill and by the eastern boundary of the site adjacent to the South Hill. Geophysics revealed 15 almost completely preserved houses and the partial plans of a further 15 with compacted floor layers. The street grid continued to the north and east of the main area of David Robinson's 1928-1938 excavations, although in the north, close to the edge of the hill, differently aligned structures backed onto a probable perimeter wall. Magnetic data showed areas of intense burning or other fired features, such as hearths. The northeast area of the North Hill may have been settled less densely with different kinds of construction, but here too, Intense magnetic responses suggest fired material. The supposed fortification wall on the east side of the North Hill also appears as a linear feature. Some of these features, including two new residential units on the North Hill and the fortification wall, were then explored by excavation. In one unit, a party wall between two houses had on the west side a cobbled surface covered with fallen roof tiles, and on the east, a further tile concentration on a white lime floor. A floor elsewhere in the same unit produced numerous fragmentary vessels, perhaps fallen from a shelf or upper storey. In the other unit, excavation revealed a so-called pastus with two rooms behind. The walls of one were coated with red plaster, which continued onto the floor, while the second contained a coarse limestone undercapital with a relief cornice. Investigation of a magnetic anomaly in the northern part of the North Hill revealed a north-south rubble wall with a large pithos to the east of it, and to the west, a circular pit or well line construction covered with tiles and ringed with stones. Inside the stone ring were two large and complete upturned pots, together with a shallow bronze bowl. At a lower level lay an east-west wall of more carefully dressed blocks. Investigation of the supposed fortification wall revealed a wide layer of river stones which may represent the foundation of a mud brick defensive wall. Preliminary assessment of the pottery reveals nothing earlier than the second quarter or later than the mid fourth century BC. While some vessels find parallels in Robinson's publication, the range of medium and coarse shapes is wider and most fine wares are probably local. Robinson of course described them as attic. The vast majority of amphorae were probably also relatively local with few imports, even from Thassos. These suggestions will be further tested via a programme of fabric analysis in collaboration with the Fitch Laboratory. The project study area covers the ancient city and its immediate hinterland. Survey here had the twin aims of understanding the functional and chronological distribution of artefacts over the North Hill, the South Hill and the Eastern Slope, 
defining the eastern boundary of the classical city and assessing the roles played by the immediate hinterland in antiquity. On the North Hill, surface collection prior to excavation combined random sampling with total collection and grab sampling of diagnostic artefacts, providing artefact density figures for a select portion of each grid square, plus information about chronology and function for the whole area. In the hinterland, field walking to the east of the South Hill located an uncultivated mound containing several large rock piles for which surface pottery indicates a 4th century BC date, as well as an in situ pithos close to the East Spur Hill. The renewal of excavation to Olynthos brings to mind the activity of school members in Macedonia during the Balkan Wars and World War I, I think specifically of Alan Wace's account of his visit to the site in the depth of winter in 1915, later published in the BSA Annual for 1916, in the expectation that the school would soon begin excavation at the site. But war intervened. As reflections on the causes and impact of World War I increasingly occupy public attention, so the long-neglected Salonica front features in our research. The second Archaeology Behind the Battle Lines colloquium, in collaboration with the British Museum, the Louvre, and the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki, examine the nature and significance of the archaeological activities of the armies stationed on the front and of the archaeolo Greek archaeological service then newly established in Macedonia, as well as the fate of the collections. This year, too, the archive has collaborated in a European initiative to integrate digital resources for the study of World War I. We contributed personal diaries, correspondence, and photographs from the longest established British family resident in Greece, the Norbakers of Evia. Philip Norbaker, who you see here, was a captain in the Friends Ambulance Unit who met his future wife, Irini, a Red Cross nurse who helped to set up and run hospital and recovery services while they were serving on the front in France and they continued working together in Belgium and Italy before returning to live in Northern Evia. As we approach the centenary of the Salonika Front, our activities will focus more on Thessaloniki and on the experience of the campaign from all sides. Remaining with our modern research, two large programs are drawing to a close. Balkan Futures, an interdisciplinary program in collaboration with the British Institute at Ankara and the École Française d'Athènes, explored common issues and relations between Greece, Turkey, and the Balkans. This year, it moved to Athens for the second milestone workshop on the nature and role of the state and other public agencies across the Balkans. Debate focused on the public institutions that deliver healthcare, education, and welfare services, on state economy relations, the historical factors behind the present form and operation of agencies, and the many challenges to be met. A major issue was the way in which the European Union has almost accidentally created a frontier zone via its succession policy in a way never conceived within the terms of the Greater European Project and the extent to which it now has the political ability or will to manage the situation. We also supported an extra workshop on imagining crisis which brought together anthropologists and visual practitioners to approach the crisis as simultaneously a field of experience, an object of representation, a sphere of affect, and a realm of cultural production. The final Project Milestone Workshop, Contemporary Mobility and Changing Stereotypes in the Balkans, was held in December last, and we'll report on it next year, and on the new research of our Project Fellow, Özge Dilova, into patterns of social mobility along the route from Istanbul to Thessaloniki. The second programme, Adriatic Connections, a collaboration with the British School at Rome, has just held its concluding conference, and the project research fellow, Magdalena Skobla, has completed a large study of figural sculpture in 11th century Dal Dalmatia, which will shortly be published by Routledge. Her work on the cult of the Virgin in the early medieval Adriatic has also resulted in a number of publications, including a study of the only icon in Apulia to depict the Virgin, the 11th century relief at Santa Maria de Dionisio in Trani, which depicts the rare so-called Oligitria Dexiocaptusa type. Well, I conclude this year's report with the first of two changes in directorial staff. After seven years of outstanding service, Robert Pitt completed his term as assistant director last summer. He remains in Athens conducting epigraphical research, teaching, and facilitating the school's teaching in epigraphy and numismatics. His successor is the former Lavendis Fellow, Chrysanthi Papadopoulou, 
an underwater archaeologist and classical period specialist who is assistant director of the Mazatos Shipwreck Project in southern Cyprus. Her research also covers perceptions of the place of the ship by mariners, maritime archaeologists, and a philosophical metaphor. She's currently editing a collection of essays entitled Humanity at Sea, Hybridity and Seafaring by anthropologists who've traveled on board ship and interviewed mariners about their interactions with their floating homes and their life at sea. She continues the school's tradition in combining archaeology and anthropology while bringing a new classical and maritime direct dimension to our work in antiquity. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude what has been, unfortunately, a highly selective report on the work of the British School in 2014. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's main lecture by Yanis Hamalakis and Nina Kiparisi on our collaborative excavations at the primarily Middle Neolithic site of Kutulu Magula. This collaboration began in 2010 when Nina Kiparisi invited Yanis Hamalakis to join her at a site on which he'd begun systematic work in 20, 2001. Tonight's lecture will focus on the latter collaborative phase of the project. The speaker, Yanis Hamalakis, professor of archaeology in the University of Southampton, is well known not only for his fieldwork in the prehistoric, Neolithic, and Bronze Age Aegean, but for his interdisciplinary focus and his championing of anthropologically informed, critical archaeological engagement with past and present material culture. This is exemplified by the Archaeological Ethnography Project, which he directed at Calavria on Poros from 2007 to 2010, and of course by the work at Kutrulu, which he'll describe this evening. Among his extensive publications, his recent books, The Nation and Its Ruins, Antiquity, Archaeology and National Imagination in Greece, Archaeological Ethnographies, and Archaeology and the Senses, Human Experience, Memory and Affect, give a flavor by virtue merely of their titles of his diverse interests which range over the archeology span of the body and the senses, consumption, the sociopolitics of the past, archeological ethnography, archeology span and photography, and critical uh, pedagogy in, arche in archeology. span It's a great pleasure to welcome Yanis to the platform. Thank you. <laughs> 